get started so we can end on time. Hi, I'm Dr. Jen Solomon. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Human Dimensions of, Conser of Natural Resources. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. And first, I want to say thank you to Ricky Burl, who has been organizing all of the seminar series speakers and doing an enormous amount of heavy lifting on organization. So let's give him a round of Our last speaker in our seminar series, series and I'm really pleased to have Megan Jones here with us today. Megan holds a BA in English from Lee College and an MS in Conservation Leadership and she's currently pursuing a doctorate in Human Dimensions and Natural Resources and her focus is behavior change. And so today she's here to present <laughs> one of her studies of her doctorate work. And so without further ado, thank you so much, Megan. Thanks, Jen. And thank you all so much for being here. I know we've got a slight imbalance in people, so I will try not to neglect those of you over here. Mm -hmm. uh, I am really honored and excited to be able to talk with you all about these issues of gender and women's leadership in conservation. It was just about two years ago now that one of my advisors, Dr. Jen Solomon, got funding from our department, Human Dimensions of Natural Resources, to start this study and brought me on to help run it. And before that point, I definitely paid attention to how issues of gender shape our world, but I think it's safe to say that now I see gender everywhere. And my point there is that these things are so ingrained in how we live our lives that we often don't recognize how they're shaping the way we interact, especially in the workplace and it takes time and, and energy to, to teach ourselves how to see some of these patterns. And it was in the 1980s that the women's studies scholar Peggy McIntosh first came up with a metaphor of the backpack to describe white privilege. And in her work, she worked with men to help them recognize their male privilege, but she, through conversations with her colleagues of color, she began to see how she herself had white privilege. And she described it as, quote, I have come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. White privilege is like an invisible weightless knapsack of special provisions, assurances, tools, maps, guides, code books, passports, visas, clothes, compass, emergency gear, and blank checks. Privilege makes like life easier and it protects you. And what McIntosh and many others are doing is calling attention to how when racial and gender hierarchies are invisible, they are harder to challenge. And I'd also emphasize that although the metaphor of the backpack makes it seem like this is an individual thing, these constructs are created by entire groups and benefit entire societies. Sorry, flip that. Benefit entire groups and are created by entire societies. And so because these are at multiple levels, welcome. They require critical self-reflection from all of us. And so in the interest of that self-reflection, I'd like to share with you all a recent experience I had with a friend who was uh, talking with his girlfriend, arguing about male privilege. And his girlfriend was trying to explain to him what it feels like to have people uh, wanting to, looking at you in certain ways and wanting to touch you uh, often, which is something that women experience regularly. And his response was something like, so it's some big problem that people think you're attractive? Which of course escalated the conversation. <laughs> and I was sitting there thinking like, don't do it, Megan, don't get involved. But I couldn't help it and I got involved. And as I was talking with my friend, I realized a couple of things. First of all, that every fact I brought forward in my ar argument, he tried to delegitimize it. And second of all, that his tone was really quite combative. And it seemed like the argument he was making was that because men sometimes experience social disadvantage, all of the ways in which women and people of color experience social disadvantage were meaningless or, or less important. And once I saw that, I tried to flip the conversation to some sort of common ground. And I asked him, maybe what we're both saying is that it's important to recognize when a particular person is being disadvantaged because of the group they belong to and then what we should do about that. And when I framed it that way, my friend actually totally agreed. And he hadn't really come 
acknowledge that white privilege or male privilege even exist. But what he had, did do is at the end of the conversation, he said, I'm really glad that we had this conversation and I really value having conversations like this. My point here being that it's important that we have these conversations, but also how we have these conversations. So talking about gender and women's leadership when there are differences in power and knowledge and beliefs requires vulnerability. And that's super powerful. So we can have these conversations in ways that protect that space. So as I talk today about our research, I invite you to think about how these issues resonate with or contradict your own experiences, what knowledge gaps still need to be filled in conservation, and what needs to be changed, if anything, about how we practice conservation. When I started this project a couple years ago, I did an extensive literature review that to uh, ground our, welcome, our semi-structured interview protocol, which I'll tell you more about later. But I first want to review some of that literature to help set the scene for this study. And what I found is that there, are a lot of re there is a lot of research about women's, leader women's leadership and women's experiences in the workplace in the United States, particularly at the professional level, which is what we're talking about. And in fact, women have been advancing pretty steadily up the levels. In fact, women have been earning a majority of bachelor's degrees in the United States since 1982. At the current moment, women are earning a majority of degrees across a range of fields, except for math and statistics, computer science, engineering, physical sciences, and architecture. Women have also been earning a majority of doctoral degrees since 2009 in the United States, and women make up about 50% of the assistant professors and about 45% of the associate professors in US universities. Women of color, so uh, black women, Latina women, Hispanic and Native American women, are at about 6 or 7% of tenured professors. However, women overall only represent a, less than a third of full professors and less than a third of college presidents. You see similar numbers in our government, where women are about 20% of the representatives in US House and Senate, and about 25% in state legislatures. And women of color are about 8% uh, in those spaces as well. And also in big businesses, so Fortune 500 companies, sorry these graphs are small, but women are about 20% of the board members and 5% of the CEOs at Fortune 500 companies. And women of color make up 4% of Fortune 500 board members and two CEOs. We're beginning to get similar data from the conservation field where I think Dr. Steph Green referenced this study in her talk last week that was done by Dr. Dorsetta Taylor, where Dr. Taylor sent surveys out to representatives of conservation organizations and got back responses from about 324 organizations that suggested that at the lower levels there is even a majority of women in conservation, but a minority at higher levels. Dr. Taylor repeated this study last year at looking at NGOs, environmental NGOs, GuideStar profiles and found that only 6% of organizations report their data. But of those that do, there seem to be maybe even a majority of women at high staff levels and a minority on the board. Similar work has been done by the organization Green 2.0, which suggests that we may be approaching gender parity in some environmental NGOs but we are nowhere near uh, having a racial representation. Again, across these studies in conservation, I want to emphasize that uh, this is self-report data, so organizations that are maybe less interested in gender or racial issues are under no obligation to share their data. And it's important here to recognize that, yes, we do want to know what the ratios of men and women are at leadership levels for several reasons. First, because our historic precedent is very few numbers of women, so it's helpful to track progress. Second, because this is some of the easier data to collect, so we can compare across fields. And also because the research shows that the ratios of men and women in a room shape how people behave. But it would be dangerous to say that just because there are women's bodies in the room that there's women's leadership happening. In other words, it's critical to avoid conflating presence and influence. 
So once women are in these rooms, are they speaking up? Are they being heard? Are they changing the direction of the organization? Are they making organization cultures more inclusive for others? And so on. This is where our second phase of our lit review started looking at this at, uh, at workplaces across the United States. And one of the things you see most obviously is what's known as the gender wage gap, where both inside professions and across professions, women are paid less than men. And this holds true uh, controlling for all other factors. Uh, this is a s one diagram that illustrates it, where you can see how race and ethnicity also play a role in salary. And uh, Native American women are not on here, but other studies have shown that they fall in about here. This also is at Colorado State. A recent study last year by the Salary Equity Committee found that women faculty earn about 5% less than their peers, and same for minority compared to white faculty. Gender discrimination and bias also shows up in the hiring and promotion process, where men are promoted faster to management and promoted faster within management than women. And even in fields that are dominated by women, such as nursing and education, you still see men being promoted faster. This study is, is one diagram that illustrates how women's representation decreases as you go up the levels. And this has also been shown in experimental studies, one that many of you might be familiar with from the STEM fields, sent identical resumes to female and male managers of labs at universities, faculty, and asked them to rate the candidates and found that the resume titled John, the candidate was rated as statistically significantly more competent, more hireable, and more likely to be a better mentor than when it was Jennifer's resume. John was also offered, on average, a higher starting salary of about $4,000 more. And this is tied up in our stereotypes of ability and what men and women are capable of. So many studies have looked at the Think Manager, Think Male Association. This a uh, photo came from a story just this past year on this month, sorry, on research where when asked to draw an effective leader, people disproportionately draw men. And this gets to basic gender associations that influence all our social interactions and our senses of ourselves as well. And the two big ones I want to emphasize are that women are supposed to be communal and men are supposed to be agentic. So communal is associated with things like helpful, gentle, sympathetic, kind, soft-spoken. And agentic is associated with assertive, dominant, forceful, self-reliant, independent, and so on. And you can see how this might pro cause a problem. And it's, what it's known as the double bind, where conforming with one stereotype makes it impossible to conform with the other stereotype. So women are supposed to be communal, but leaders are supposed to be agentic. And this makes it difficult to balance, to, to kind of for women to, to succeed, you have to be both competent and warm. Men can be communal or agentic and get along just fine. Other consequences of this are that women's ideas tend to get ignored by men. Women are interrupted but more than men. This study came out last year from uh, looking at transcripts of the Supreme Court, where it found that in oral arguments, male members of the court interrupted fem their female counterparts three times more than they interrupted each other. And also, women who make mistakes, those mistakes in the workplace get held against them more than men's do. We also have to talk about sexual harassment here, because the sexual harassment literature is pretty clear on two things. First of all, sexual harassment is a systemic problem. It's more than individuals abusing their power. It's institutions creating spaces in which that abuse is tolerated. This gets represented in the legal definitions of sexual harassment, where you have quid pro quo harassment, sexual harassment, sexual demands are made in exchange for job benefits, and hostile work environment harassment, where it's pervasive in the workplace. The second thing that the literature shows is that sexual harassment can be an effective tool to silence and delegitimize women leaders. So one study found that when women were more agentic, more assertive and dominant, they were on the receiving end of more sexual harassment. So it can be a way to resist women's leadership. On the other hand, as the Me Too movement shows, we're seeing cultural change on this, right? Like this is changing over time. And it's possible that this can continue to change as women fill more roles that they have historically not held. 
and organizations and individuals can do things to help overcome these challenges. The literature shows that mentorship can help increase women's sense of belonging, their self-confidence, and their retention in a field. Champions or sponsors who help give women access to opportunities and connect them with their networks have also been shown to make a difference. And these are roles that can be filled by both women and men. And women have other roles to play in terms of acting as role models, working within women's networks, and being peer colleagues to, to share uh, experiences. And there's also a role for formal organizational policies on harassment and equal hiring. And so we looked at all this, and then we tried to find stuff in the conservation literature. And it's not, there's not a lot. Uh, I will say that there has been more attention in the last two or three years, as many, if not all of you, are aware in our federal agencies. I, as I was pulling together this presentation, I took some screenshots of some of the uh, articles on High Country News on this in the last two or three years. And they paint a picture that shows that this is pretty systemic across the Park Service or Forest Service, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and in other disciplines such as wildfire fighting. And even just this month, we also saw a study, a survey, sorry, an article come out from Manga Bay looking at Conservation International and showing that employees there suggest that a culture of abuse has been tolerated or, or not dealt with for years there. Research from an adjacent field on academic fieldwork suggests that women scientists in remote areas may be more likely to experience sexual harassment. The Department of Interior actually did a survey of all employees in response to this publicity and found that, this was last year, found that women and sexual minorities were disproportionately likely to experience gender and sexual harassment and that gender and sexual harassment was seen as having, the, felt as having the biggest impact on the uh, recipients of it. I should go back and say that one in three employees had experienced some kind of harassment in the previous 12 months. When it comes to reporting it, this is a pretty complicated figure, but on the top line are all the things showing that when people did complain that someone took no action or they were even discouraged from taking it further, and that in very few cases was official action taken against the perpetrator or was an investigation conducted. And this has consequences, right? Because in this case, a, a roughly a third of employees reported considering leaving the organization in response to harassment, and actually 7% had requested a transfer. I figured, thank you. <laughs> And other than sexual harassment, though, we don't have a tremendous amount in the literature. What you see is on women's leadership and gender is examples like this of looking at it in issues of conservation projects and programs, where research has suggested, has delved into the, the social norms that women might prevent women from speaking in mixed group settings or uh, being able to attend meetings held at the wrong time of day, issues around unequal land tenure and so forth. But there is a gap when it comes to research on conservation professionals' experiences advancing to leadership, which is where our study comes in. We asked two questions. First, what are the gender challenges that women in conservation face as they advance <coughs> to leadership? And second, what supports help them overcome those challenges? I need to mention briefly what we are not going to talk about today. There is extensive literature that looks at how gendered expectations around family and home life shape women's advancement to leadership. Uh, and this was a crucial part of our, of our interviews and looking at both issues around motherhood and broader work-life balance of, of having a life outside of conservation. But for reasons of time, I just can't get into that now. So if you have questions, I'd love to talk about it later. We used a semi-structured interview method, methodology to gather our data and restricted our study population to women who f met these four criteria. So we wanted them to be in some kind of leadership position with a scientific background in conservation organizations and agencies in the United States. And we did that to try and restrict some of the heterogeneity that can come out from cross-cultural or international workplace differences, as well as the fact that many women and organizations are more represented in the HR tract, and that's not really what we're trying to focus on here. 
We use snowball sampling methods, so starting with a seed population of people in our own professional networks and then asking for them to refer us to other women who might fit in the sample. And we conducted these interviews in the summer of 2016. They lasted on average about 45 to 90 minutes, which was often really generous from <laughs> women at very high levels. And they were conducted in person, over the phone, or via Skype. We trans recorded these interviews with the women's permission and then transcribed them and analyzed the transcripts using modified grounded theory. So first using initial coding to pull out concepts from the transcripts, and then second using focused coding to merge those concepts into categories. And throughout this process, we tried to protect our participants' confidentiality by redacting personally identifiable information from quotes and giving everyone a code name so that they are not rep cannot be identified. I interviewed 63 women in, from a range of conservation <coughs> science disciplines in middle, high, and very senior leadership positions at state agencies, federal agencies, NGOs, and conservation organizations. We used purposive sampling to try and get some diversity of perspective within this, and we really tried to speak with as many women of color as we could, and got 14% women of color in our sample. And our women were age, ranged in age from their 20s to their 60s, but as you can see, the majority were in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And so what did we find? I'm gonna take a drink here to build anticipation. <laughs> Our results suggest that there is an implicit gender hierarchy in the conservation workplace by which men are perceived and as, as and treated as superior to women in a variety of ways. And specifically, our interview participants suggested there were six categories of this experience, which I'll delve more into over the few, next few minutes. Every participant in our study had experienced or witnessed a gender challenge in one of these six areas. And the vast majority, 70% of our sample, had experienced or witnessed four or more of these categories. The first one is salary inequality and difficulty negotiating. And I'm going to illustrate all of these with <coughs> quotes from the interviews, bless you, to uh, give you a sense of what these experiences look like. So salary inequality and difficulty negotiating included women being paid less than male colleagues at the same level. As one participant said, quote, you can go online and look at people's salaries. I was the lowest paid person in my job class in my last job, and I'm one of the lowest paid people in my job now. Women also express concerns around negotiating, either not having been trained in it or feeling guilty if they do do it, and that organizations are failing to assess or address salary inequality. One woman described a conversation with an HR representative in which, quote, literally her mouth dropped open and she was like, I cannot believe you are making so little. Why are you at this level? And I was like, I don't know. There is no transparency in how salaries are set. This was reported by 20 participants or 36% of the people I talked to. Formal exclusion was reported by 25 interviewees or about 45% of our sample and included firing and promotion issues. So women feeling that the women are not receiving promotions, as one participant said, quote, I also just don't think women get moved up as quickly, even if they're doing the same level of work. S women feeling that men are promoted more quickly than women, and that less competent men are hired in over more competent women, rather than promoting the women. One participant said, quote, he is being promoted to potentially be the lead of this topic for which my female colleague is much, 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 much more qualified. I mean, he basically has no qualifications for the role. Informal exclusion consists of moments when women conservationists are denied opportunities to participate and was reported by 45 interviewees, or about 80% of the people I talked to and includes women not being invited to or not present in decision-making spaces. As one participant said, quote, it's like these informal side conversations where people are making huge decisions that are then brought back to the table without collaborative, collective decision-making. Women also experience being talked over, being interrupted or not invited to talk in meetings with men. As one participant said, quote, I have heard from other women who have had higher positions than me PhDs, well-respected, very accomplished, 
that they have the, had the experience where in a meeting men talk over them a lot, interrupt them a lot, take credit for their ideas. Which gets to another point, that men restate women's ideas and receive recognition for the ideas that the women do not. In addition, men ask women to do administrative roles that are not part of their leadership. As one participant said, quote, when I first started the last job, there was a lot of ganging up against the few female employees that were there. A lot of them didn't last. A lot of, you can make my coffee, you can make the photocopies, when it was like, I'm actually the biologist here. And when women report throughout their careers not receiving as much support as men do to do their jobs or advance. Harassment and inadequate organizational response was reported by 42 participants, or 75% of the folks I spoke with. First of all, women report being harassed in the work conservation workplace. One participant described it as, quote, something that has come up for younger female colleagues who are in potentially indirect supervision relationships with older males who, and it's more of an inappropriate language, and maybe the supervising individual doesn't even realize that they're making someone very uncomfortable. This can also be more egregious in terms of verbal or physically threatening behavior from male supervisors and colleagues, including yelling, gesticulating in women's faces, and one, in one case, uh, punching a wall next to a woman. And when this gets reported, the organizations women conservationists feel are not de dealing with it appropriately. So in many cases, women do not feel able to report this because of a fear of a retaliation or a belief that reporting will not lead to change. One participant said, quote, I've thought about reporting it, and then I was like, why? He won't be held accountable for change. It would be on me, and it would be something like, you need to take that less personally. Women who do report harassment experience retaliation from colleagues and supervisors. One participant described it as, quote, it was definitely not like a good for her for standing up for herself. It was more of a like a, wow, what a troublemaker. Couldn't she have handled that herself? Organizations often do not take action when an incident is reported. As one participant said, I don't think he got reprimanded at all, so my confidence in the ability to address that is fairly low. And if they do take action, the participants I spoke with often felt that it was not sufficient or proportional to what had happened. And also that harassment policies and reporting mechanisms are sometimes only put into place after a major organizational scandal. The fifth category of gender challenge was an assumption of inadequacy, which encompasses an underlying impression suggested by men's statements and actions that they believe women are not capable of doing conservation science or being conservation leaders. It was reported by 36 interviewees, about 64% of our sample. This includes men disbelieving or being surprised at women's successes. One participant put it, quote, they'll still be really surprised, like, oh, you got that job? Really? You'll be like, yeah, I did. Why are you surprised? You're surprised because I'm a woman. And it's just insidious. It just is. But then you keep being battered by it along the way. The impact of that is like, wow, maybe I shouldn't have gotten that job. Men also often assume that women are not the authority figure in a given situation, maybe walking straight past the woman leader to talk to her male supervisee. And male colleagues and employees challenge women's right to be in a leadership position. As one participant put it, quote, I definitely go into a lot of situations knowing, okay, I'm going to be with all men. They're, I've got to be on my game because they're going to look at me as less than equal. That's a given. This also includes women striving not to fail because they perceive that every mistake counts against them. As one participant put it, quote, I definitely encountered a lot of people that either outright told me I should not be where I was, or they didn't believe I could do the work, or that it was pretty obvious this was the case. And you had to make sure people saw you were competent. Women also internalize this by taking on those administrative roles that are not in their leadership job. As one participant said, quote, I try really hard to not fall into the position of like, I'll get the coffee, I'll, let me go get lunch, but I have to be purposeful about it. Finally, the assumption of wrongness is similar to that in that it is an underlying impression suggested by men's statements and actions that they believe women are in some way unfit for the role of conservation leader. It was reported by 46 interviewees, or 82% of our sample. And this gets back to the double bind issue. From, on the one hand, women who claim authority by being assertive are perceived negatively and critiqued by their colleagues and supervisors. One woman said, quote, she was brilliant and incredibly assertive. 
everybody hated her. <laughs> Other people that weren't brilliant and incredibly assertive and that weren't women didn't have that level of negativity surrounding them. On the other hand, women who do not behave assertively are told to be more assertive. Quote, the number of times I've been told by my predecessors that I'm not fierce enough or I'm not loud enough or I'm not assertive enough or I'm not aggressive enough. And this manifests in other ways, like women being perceived as too young, too old, too middle-aged, being asked if, quote, they're old enough to be there. And women being perceived as too overtly feminine to do the job. One woman said, quote, I would never wear high heels to a conservation conference. It's a judgment of that that means you're not serious about this work and you're not ready to go out in the field and do what needs to be done. We also did a little bit of keyword analysis and the women we spoke with were very attentive to how being assertive gets labeled in the conservation workplace. It includes being seen as complaining, demanding, a Debbie Downer, hard to work with, a troublemaker, a potster, too passionate or too emotional, pushy, too pushy, pushy or bossy, too aggressive and too pushy, overbearing, in your face, aggressive and in your face, combative, argumentative, too abrasive, having claws, <laughs> something biological, being moody or on their period, being menopause, hormones, shrill, and of course, the bitch word. <laughs> and these challenges were experienced by women all across our sample, but women of color drew attention to ways in risk which race and ethnicity also played a role in this. So the women of color I spoke with described how sensations of being the only woman or only person of color in the room time after time, and how colleagues drew attention to this even in positive ways about them being a minority. Various ways that they are assumed to be inadequate to be conservation leaders in subtle communication, and also that someone like them just doesn't fit with the role of conservation leader. And the fact that, as one participant put it, white women may struggle to be heard or get a seat at the table, but women of color, we haven't even stepped into the building. Fortunately, the women I spoke with also described helpful supports that had aided them in their careers. And we asked them to identify some of the things that had been most helpful for them as they advanced. And this really boiled down to, in the coding process, two categories, structural supports and supportive relationships. And I'll get into but what both of those look like. So structural supports are formal mechanisms, policies, and, and uh, structures put in place by organizations to account for these issues, and was identified by 14 participants as being really helpful. And this include formal opportunities for women to gain skills. One woman said, quote, participating in some leadership trainings that taught me the skills to seek a mentor, to seek assistance where I probably wouldn't have done it, as well as structural changes to make organizations more gender equitable. One instance of this was, quote, having the sexual harassment support system, having that in place, because then you can be a fully confident, competent woman in your job. You don't have to worry, will I lose my job? How, being so careful about how you say it or do say things. Salary transparency also came up in this um, organizational assessments of what's going on and efforts to deal with it. Supportive relationships were even more important, it seemed like. 39 participants really emphasized this, and it was something that folks from all different roles could, could do, both leaders and peers, but leaders were much more strongly emphasized, and this could be male or female, advisors, supervisors, mentors, leaders in the field who undertook a variety of behaviors that include providing opportunities for women to grow. One participant said, quote, he really gave me opportunities to grow and to learn and took me into his confidence. And because of that, I grew leaps and bounds in that experience because he believed in me and gave me opportunities. It also involves learning women's individual needs. As one participant said, people who you're responsible to who have the capacity for everyone they supervise to kind of in understand them as an individual and figure out how to equip, the equip them to be successful. These also included giving feedback and helping women set goals. For instance, quote, most helpful for me is someone who can work with me pretty regularly. They can catch the sort of day-to-day -day things or decisions we make that we could be doing a better job to promote ourselves or to advance our positions. 
It was also helpful when leaders connected women to their own networks and championed their work. One woman said, quote, I watch her in action, and she'd always promote me and make sure I had exposure and experience and opportunity, always introducing me, just very cognizant. She was a great role model on how to be a good mentor, and she still is. As, and finally, leaders who demonstrate confidence in women, thus building women's own self-confidence. This includes, one participant summed this up as, quote, just people believing in me, people that made me feel like I could do it or assumed that I could do it. That made a big difference for me, having that. And then these other things are just some smaller bumps then and don't become big barriers for you. Women I spoke with also emphasized that female leaders can be role models, like I referred to earlier, that, that female peers can be a support system to vent about some of these and process and work through it, and that male supervisors and coworkers who demonstrate a belief in gender equality really make a difference. Also, women of color identified that having some of these similar things, but particularly having other folks like them who were experiencing similar challenges around race and ethnicity and who they could talk with and, and share and, and learn from even as mentors as well. So I am really interested to hear all of your thoughts and reactions and questions to some of this work, but I would like to talk about some of my reactions to the data as I've seen it. First of all, that supports do seem to make a difference. The women I spoke with, even those who'd experienced lots of challenges, made a point to emphasize how much they appreciated or how helpful it was when people and, and organizations made their jobs easier. Also that women have very heterogeneous experiences in conservation, right? So some women had experienced a lot of challenges, others only a few. Some had been in organizations where the culture really seemed to condone or tolerate these gender challenges, and others had been in organizations where the culture was not this way. Uh, women, some women had described more challenges when they were younger that got easier as they got older, or more challenges in junior roles that became less problematic as they got advanced. Obviously, those are interacting. And that women can be and are being proactive in their careers to advance, right? So this includes seeking out leaders as support structures, advisors and mentors and good supervisors. It includes initiating or advocating for a structural change around salaries and sexual harassment to, to make the culture better for themselves and others. And it includes... Um, had one more there. Oh yeah, finding ways to navigate these stereotypes in their own advancement and trying to seek that balance between being comp to be competent and warm and adopting behaviors that get them through daily interactions with other men around them. Also, that it's important to point out that experiencing bias doesn't mean you help others necessarily. So some of the women I spoke with had overcome gender challenges in their own careers and were not sympathetic to women who couldn't overcome it. Other women had not experienced challenges and didn't see why this was still a problem. Also, experiencing gender challenges doesn't mean that you are uh, sensitive to the needs of other marginalized or excluded groups, particularly women of color or people of color more broadly in conservation. And finally, the, the women I spoke with really emphasized their hope for the future. I have some quotes that illustrate that. One participant said, there's a lot more women in conservation now. I'm hopeful that future generations will have more women to approach and to think about. They also said things like, there are some stunningly talented young women in our staff, and that's why I'm so optimistic. We're also starting to see some changes at the organizational level. These are a few of the folks women of color who have been hired as diversity, directors of diversity, equity, and inclusion for various big conservation organizations. These were the only ones I could find, so if you know of any more, that would be great. <laughs> and we can all take steps to make progress on these issues. Uh, one thing that I'm going to be doing is to continue this research. I mentioned earlier that we haven't yet finished analyzing the data on work-life balance, so that's the next step for me, is to identify what those categories are. I'm also interested to examine the impacts of challenges and supports on women's well-being and their careers, organizational cultures, and effectiveness, because a snowball sample design is not systematic and didn't get at some of that granularity. And 
I'm curious to know more about how being aware of these issues and patterns shapes women's inter experiences. Like, if you know more about gender challenges, are you better able to navigate them in the workplace? And also, I think it's important to expand this work to other regions like Africa or Latin America, where there may be many fewer women at high levels. I would also say that if any of you are interested in continuing this work, there's plenty of resources here at CSU at many different levels. There's clubs called, like Graduate Women in Science and 500 Women Scientists who are active on campus and in town. I can connect you with those folks. There's courses from Women's Studies and affiliate faculty, including one this fall in psychology. There's the Women and Gender Collaborative, which is doing all kinds of programs and workshops and trainings across campus. For men, there is a program called Man Educate Yourself that is run by and for men to have conversations about these issues among senior leaders at CSU. And there are external resources, loads of stuff on the internet. One thing that I enjoyed recently was the Women at Work podcast series from Harvard Business Review that talked through a lot of, okay, what do you do if someone's interrupting you at work? Or how do you grapple with sexual harassment? And of course, I would love it if anyone wants to email me to continue this conversation afterwards. There are so many people I have to thank for this work, particularly all of the women who participated and who gave their time so generously and shared their experiences, as well as my advisors, Dr. Jen Solomon and Dr. Tara Thiel, our project assistant, Danielle Abueso, who helped us transcribe and analyze, our funders from our HDNR department and the Colorado chapter of the Wildlife Society, and all of you for being here. I have references that I'm happy to share with anyone who's interested. <laughs> And I'd love to take questions. Yes. So you said a lot of people were hopeful in your interviews. I'm curious with the ones that kind of had more of the toxic work environments, if they had noticed any changes um, or were there things that they noticed that actually worked that changed those kind of environments um, to where they kind of looked optimistic, or is it all based off of we're just hopeful that generationally this is all going to go away and right. that's why we're hopeful and, and optimistic? Right. So I'm curious if there's a reason yeah. beyond just age and that's a great changing question. society. Some of the folks I spoke with who were at uh, organizations where there was a very closed male culture at the top were not as optimistic for those organizations. I, I think there was optimism at the scale of the field, right? Seeing this come up from the bottom and, and also seeing that younger men are also more clued into some of this stuff and engaging in these conversations. But in terms of working with male leaders who don't want to work back. <laughs> I didn't get a lot there. Yeah. How do you or do you plan to communicate the results to the organizations that employ mm. women in conservation? And like, do you think that your, like, would your message change at all? Or would you give the same talk? Do you think? To an organization? Yeah, to an organization. That well, I definitely couldn't just feed it back to organizations from which women participated. Um, but fortunately, there are women at pretty much every conservation organization these days. So I would love to get this out more actively to organizations. And that's something that Jen and I have talked about in terms of next stages of the research is like, OK, this is happening. And what do we do? Because that's really what a lot of organizations are interested in is how do we help if this is going on? Um, I think that it's important that to recognize, I, I'm a mixed methods or qualitative scientist, so I think the quotes are really important because sometimes people say, oh, this isn't happening, it can't be meaningful. And even in the fact that this is happening among our sample is really important and important to get those voices out. So I would keep emphasizing that, I think. Yes, and then. Yeah, did um, any of the women you've talked to did they discuss any um, male leaders that were kind of in that supportive relationship role and what those uh, males were doing to help support them to like move up through the ranks? And Absolutely. Yeah, that 
was huge because a lot of these women, if they're in spaces where there are only male leaders, they need those male leaders to bring them up. And that, all of that stuff about what the leaders were doing, that was men and women. So everything from, um, all of providing opportunities, learning individuals' needs, helping them set goals, connecting them and uh, championing them, building their self-confidence. Those were all things that men were described as having doing, and as well as the like, having educated themselves about, um, oops, sorry, uh, about what gender equality is and, and how to go about it. So, Brett. Sense on how your results compare to other fields and industries, and there's anything about conservation, or does this generally represent uh, Trend that mm. That's a great question. It's difficult to compare cross fields with qualitative data because I'm not trying to generalize. I think there is something specific to the fieldwork component of conservation that comes out in multiple ways. The sexual harassment piece, obviously you're more vulnerable in the field to call predation from colleagues. Uh, also, the assumption of wrongness about being too feminine, that was definitely a conservation. The idea that, you know, if you uh, wear mascara, then you can't possibly know how to trap an animal. Um, that can, and I think that is specific to our field. It, there, we didn't do enough, you know, if, if we could be more systematic, I would think, I would want to look into the difference of, like, State, state agencies particularly, or those more resource extraction organizations where there's people described it as the hook and bullet culture that has historically been more masculine. So those are some of the pieces where it's in our field, yeah. Um, I was curious if you know like about how many people in your sample are from organizations versus agencies. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. forgetting this, but just like if you saw any kind of split at all in the trends if you're not <coughs> government agency or, you know, a nonprofit type of thing, or did you yeah. not have great enough from each to really compare? There were examples that stood out in a variety of ways. So about thirty of the about half were at NGOs, and the rest were at, a couple were at conservation organizations of various kinds, and then the rest were at state or federal agencies. And there were some instances of big NGOs where that were more male dominated that were quite, um, where this was quite common. There were cases of state agencies where this was quite common. Smaller, you know, if, if, if you're a small NGO where there's only women working there, it's a lot less common, but in terms of generalizing to the group, I, I couldn't say, yeah. Comment and question. So, so one of the comments is that you can generalize qualitatively, I can help you. Um, and it does, it absolutely is consistent. This, the question I have is like, is there, was there just this kind of default kind of definition of leadership? Mm. Yes, I meant to point that out. Thank you for asking about that. We use leadership in this study to be positional leadership. There is great work being done by Dr. Brett Briere and others on conservation leadership specifically in terms of skills and behaviors. But when we talked about leadership, it was, it was positional. So. And it was hard to compare across organizations for scale, right? Because there's so big, uh, so much variation in the size and what does very high or middle look like. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Megan, thank you for that presentation. Um, I, I was very impressed with the findings because um, coming from Ethiopia into the United States and entering the academic world, the conservation field, I definitely thought a lot of things were a, a lot more different mm -hmm. in, the, in the United States than they would be back in Ethiopia. Just because, um, in my own experiences in the academic field, also working in the conservation field in Ethiopia, uh, I can relate to almost all of the points that you mentioned here. Um, and that's basically uh, an uncomfortable zone that I've always <coughs> experienced in the workforce, in the academic field. Um, as a woman in conservation. Uh, and so coming into the United States, I definitely had a different perception of how better things would be. So it was an interesting finding for me to, to see this input. Um, and of course, I have different experiences within the United States as a woman of color. That's a whole different experience. Uh, but I think it would be definitely interesting to do further studies in other contexts, just because I think 
terms of the recommendation to move forward, there could be lessons that could be shared because I definitely feel like even though the experiences I've had are similar, mm -hmm. I also think the extent and the magnitude is much um, more pronounced mm -hmm. in, uh, in other contexts, like at least in the context of Ethiopia or you know other countries in Africa that have had experiences with. So I think it would be useful to kind of like take lessons from you know the United States and do uh, comparative studies. That's a really great point, and thank you for sharing your experiences in Ethiopia. I, context plays a huge role in this, and we in this study were sort of trying to get a sense of like what's going on more broadly across the field, but the next steps to me think, seem to be much more like context specific, and, and given these particular pressures and challenges, what do we do in this space? So that's a great idea, and I'd love to collaborate with you on it. Yes? Um, did you hear any participants report receiving sort of those same issues from women? Like, like oh, yes. women sort of perpetuating the, the male um, stereotypes and... Absolutely, yeah, that, that did come up often and I, often with a sense of sort of bafflement on the part of the person I was speaking to, of like, I don't know why, why this is happening, they're another woman, shouldn't they? get it more, um, but that, that gets at the difference between positional leadership and, and styles and behaviors, right? That if, it, if it's a more masculine or a more um, hierarchical or more exclusive culture, that women can absolutely perpetuate that and also maybe even require women to go through the same hurdles that they themselves had gone through as like a trial by fire sort of experience was, was talked about. Great question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, related to that, did you notice uh, any striking differences across those age cohorts? That's where I wanted to look more at the influence of awareness on women's experiences because there's definitely been cultural shifts across the generations about like how we ta have these conversations and there's been work done in other studies about how, um, for instance, sexual harassment, if you come up in a workspace where that's more tolerated and then you continue to tolerate it being done to other young women around you, right? So I, I saw young women talking about exactly the same challenges that older women were like, well, that was in the past, and it was still happening to other young women. Uh, and I would, I would like to delve more into where, what that, where that is coming from, right? Because we, there is this assumption that it's generational, but it may, it may not go away, and that's the active part of the hope piece. <laughs>